Thank you for checking out Lakehead International's videos. You're about to watch one of our Lakehead International live webinars, a fun and informative way to learn more about Lakehead while also meeting faculty, staff, and current students. If you have any questions throughout today's video, please comment below. Otherwise, let's get started. Hello everyone and welcome to another Lake at International Live. My name is Jordan Ball. I'll be your host today. Uh, we are again hosting another International Lecture Showcase. We're joined by Dr. Herman Vandenberg, who I'll introduce in just a moment. But first and foremost, I want to take this opportunity to thank you for joining us. Whether it's your morning, your afternoon, your evening, um, we appreciate your time. We hope you're excited to learn more about crypto assets and as we have phrased it, why all the interest? Um, and on that same note, I would like to pass over to our special guest, Dr. Herman Vandenberg, to introduce himself before we chat about upcoming events. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Dr. Herman Vandenberg, as uh, Jordan just mentioned. I've been a professor at Lakehead University since 2009 um, at the Aurelia campus, and um, I'm very interested in crypto assets. So I hope I can uh, impart some knowledge with you today. Thank you. Thank you again for joining us. I'm excited to dive into your session. Okay, so um, first of all, I want to start off with a, a disclaimer. Um, basically, um, this is, I'm not going to give you any uh, investment advice here. Um, and Lakehead University is not approved or said anything about um, what I'm going to talk about. These are basically my opinions, my research. So any errors, uh, or omissions, they are totally mine. I take total responsibility for that, okay? And again, I want to emphasize this is not investment advice. So um, I am just have a question for you, uh, Jordan. Do we have a poll at some point? We do have a poll, yes. You know, you know, speaking of that, I think we could actually uh, kick it off now as you start to discuss some of the, the items on your screen now. This will give us a better idea to our audience. What is your experience with cryptocurrency or crypto assets? So which of the following best describes you? There's six options there. So some of them range from I've never done anything with crypto assets to I actively trade it or I've purchased it in the past. Um, so we'll give, give everyone some time to read over those different options and, and answer. Um, but I'll pass back to Dr. Herman Vandenberg to continue on and then we'll wrap this up here in a minute or two. Okay, thank you, Jordan. Um, this this information will sort of help me um, determine the speed at which to go through some of these topics, because if you've got a lot of experience with crypto, this might be rather boring to you. Uh, if you have no experience, um, you know, then this is gonna to be totally new to you and it might be a bit fast. So as a professor, I always try to sort of make sure that the people who are well versed on a topic um, are also challenged, but also, you know, the, the people that are sort of in, 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 on average, um, you know, that they they also find it useful. For sure. So as uh, responses roll in, it looks like fifty six percent so far have never purchased any crypto assets, but they plan to do so in the not so distant future. I'm going to end that poll and actually share the results just so everyone can take a peek and get to see them a bit better. Um, it looks like one person has only traded Bitcoin, um, but they don't currently own any. Um, a few folks have purchased an altcoin such as Ether. I'm not going to even pronounce some of those, uh, and they still own some. Um, others have traded altcoin, but they don't actually own any altcoins right now. And the last one, again, jumping over the I've never purchased, uh, but I hope to do so. Um, they've never purchased or uh, any crypto assets, and they have no intentions on doing so. So fair enough to those. Uh, they're still interested in learning. I'm excited to learn myself. I think I would sit somewhere around. I don't own any myself, but hopefully in the near future, I'll be able to. So with that, I'll, I'll pass it back to you. Okay, thank you. And the poll is still... Uh, blocking my view at the moment. There we go. Should be gone now. Okay. So um, I'm going to start with a number of uh, definitions. Um, basically, things like blockchain, Ether, Solana, Cardano, all of those other so-called altcoins are uh, a database. That's basically what they are. And they're cryptographically secured. And uh, blockchain is one type of 
uh, distributed ledger uh, technology. And the reason I, I focus on, let me just, I'm going to have to stop the share to get rid of the poll. Okay, the reason I focus on distributed ledger technology is because that's the basic technology that underlies the creation of all blockchains. So regardless of what type of crypto asset you're looking at, it's some form of distributed ledger technology. And by distributed, what we mean is that um, there are a number of computers are also called nodes that are on the internet that basically secure um, the blockchain. And it's a ledger, ledger meaning a database. Um, in accounting, you'll learn about uh, general ledgers, for example. And, and basically, instead of, for example, a bank maintaining a ledger of what, what um, money you have in an account, it's a number of, it's multiple computers keeping that ledger. So that has, uh, pluses and minuses, and we'll we'll talk about them in a minute. The way blockchains operate is they operate on a on a consensus basis. So, if you all the computers have to agree. So, if um, I want to send Jordan some Bitcoin, for example, and uh, I do a transfer from my wallet to his wallet, uh, all of the uh, nodes, all of the computers on this on the distributed ledger have to agree okay, on the amount and everything else. And everybody can see, and I'll give you an example in a few minutes about uh, what's in a wallet. And so even though um, you know, the, the individual may not be recognized by the, the code or the wallet, everybody can see a particular wallet and what's in it. It also, of course, means everything has to be synchronized. All of the computers have to agree. Uh, computers that don't agree, for example, uh, will not get to participate in, in what's called a proof of stake system. Okay, there, there, there is no central authority, there is no uh, central bank that controls, um, you know, there are, there are intermediaries in the sense of that there are some uh, trading platforms or exchanges, so you, you can uh, exchange one crypto asset for another or for a fiat currency. But there's no central authority that controls them all. The many of the exchanges, however, are um, I would say private, in the sense that that um, you have no control over over the exchanges, and they, they don't follow the same rules as the distributed ledger itself. Um, blockchains are immutable. So immutable, what that means is they can't be changed. Once uh, uh, I shouldn't say never can be changed. It can be changed with very, under very difficult circumstances. So what that means is that if you want to check what happened um, a few years ago in my wallet, then you could go and you could trace those steps backwards. So for an audit perspective, it's it's very good. You can always find a trail. The downside is if I'm by mistake, send Jordan my Bitcoin, I can't get them back. Okay, so. It's, it's immutable in that sense. So there's pluses and minuses to it. So you have to be very careful. Let me just see if I can get this to go ahead one slide. Here we go. Okay, so here, here is a an wallet address. This is, this is my wallet, one of my wallets, I guess. And everybody can see that who is on um, the internet. Basically, you go to etherscan.io, you Type in this address, it's my wallet. I'm telling you that it's my wallet, but you could not tell from these digits, these characters that it's my wallet. And this is a, a while back. And the value of the 14 tokens that I had in that account at that point was $10.61. Um, I just looked yesterday and um, I only there's only four of them that have any value. And that's because uh, one of the things I did was we used this wallet for was what are called airdrops. And I'll tell you what those are uh, in a minute. Okay, so everybody can see this. Um, you can also look up the records to see 
what moved in and out and when it moved in and out. <clears throat> so the, the record is, is public. Okay, everybody uh, agrees on it. Everybody in this system agrees on it, um, but you don't necessarily know who it is. So there's anonymity involved, which some crypto assets are more anonymity focused like Monero, um, others less so. So some more definitions, cryptography, uh, that's where the name crypto assets originates from. And it's basically a method for protecting and securing information through encryption. So if you have a password, uh, that's cryptographically secured. Crypto asset, I, I use this term, but um, there are many, there's, it, it hasn't been settled yet what, what the best terms are. There, crypto assets are private digital assets, um, private in the sense that, that um, I, I control my own wallet. They're digital in the sense that they reside on the internet and they're basically uh, uh, recorded on a distributed ledger or a blockchain, for example. Now, cryptocurrencies, is, is something generally more specifically, although the terms are interchangeably used. Um, those are crypto assets that act as a medium of exchange. So an alternate to say the US dollar or, or any other fiat currency. The, the, there's a lot of argument about whether crypto can act as a currency. There's a number of requirements for um, anything actually to act as a currency and Crypto assets in many ways fall short of being a true currency. A funny term, HODLer, it's uh, anyone who holds onto their crypto assets. In other words, someone who doesn't trade them very often or doesn't trade them, just buys them and hangs onto them. And at some point, somebody misspelled the term holder and they miss the, uh, in, you know, exchanged the L and the D in the, in the spelling and the term sort of stuck. So if you see HODLer, you'll know what it means and that basically it was a mistake, but it's stuck. It's kind of funny. Okay, so you may have heard of Bitcoin. It's the first decentralized cryptocurrency. So it was, it was I believe 2009, the first trade was made by the by um, Shitashi Nakamoto, who's, who's, who is anonymous. No one knows who or how many people. Um, created this, but it, it was kind of in response to the financial crisis of 2008. Um, you know, banks are being bailed out by governments and, and the, the feeling was that we needed some alternative to the banking system. Um, it's still a large portion of the trading that takes place every day is in Bitcoin. Maybe I think it's around 39% now. Uh, at one time it was 100%. Ethereum is the second largest crypto asset. It uh, was invented by a Russian Canadian. Um, and uh, while we're on this topic, there are many sort of international Canadian connections to uh, crypto assets. Uh, Binance, which is, I believe, the largest uh, trading platform in the world, is, is um, run by a, a Chinese Canadian. So there are, there's a lot of international connections uh, in crypto assets. Gas is basically the, the cost of doing a transaction. So uh, you can think of this as if you were in business and you're running a, uh, you're selling services or products uh, and you're accepting um, a credit card like Visa, MasterCard, American Express, you have to pay those companies to, to collect the money for you. Uh, and similarly, on a, if you want to trade uh, Ethereum, you, or, or send it somewhere, you pay a very small cost called gas. And it's a very it's a very small fraction of the Ethereum cost. Um, altcoins are basically any crypto assets other than Bitcoin. It, that term is sort of losing its, uh, its strength because there are so many of them. Tokens, they're, uh, typically they are crypto assets that sit on the Ethereum blockchain. There are other, um, blockchains that are competing now with Ethereum that basically will also let you um, host crypto assets called tokens. They're typically of two sorts, security tokens and utility tokens. Security tokens are the ones that the regulatory um, agencies are most concerned about. 
Um, utility tokens, not so much. Utility tokens are tokens you buy for performing some type of utility, like file storage, for example. DeFi is a short form for decentralized fi finance. Okay, so in other words, uh, an alternative to the centralized financial system that we that most of the world runs on. A fork. Okay, this is where where the blockchain does break, where there's typically what happens is there is a, um, a hacking incident. Lots of uh, crypto assets are stolen, um, and um, some people believe that the immutability is more important. Others believe that you know the the theft should be reversed. So it happened with Bitcoin. It happened with Ethereum. So with Bitcoin, Bitcoin itself, uh, if you buy Bitcoin now, you are buying one that it, that in which the uh, theft has been reversed. If you are a strong believer in uh, immutability, then Bitcoin Cash carries on the original blockchain. The same with Ethereum and Ethereum Classic. Ethereum has had some hacks and they've been reversed, um, but Ethereum Classic has not. It's kept the original blockchain. Now, the only way, way you can reverse this is if um, a transaction is if basically everyone agrees that or most people agree on the on the reversal, and those that don't basically um, are part of the fork that creates things like Ethereum Classic and Bitcoin Cash. A whale, that's a slang term for anyone holding more than 1% of a crypto asset. And basically uh, what that means is, is that they can either sell their assets or buy more, and by doing so they can, in a sense, move the market. They can change the price that everybody else sees just because they're so large. Proof of work and proof of stake. So Bitcoin uses proof of work. In other words, they have so-called miners who run their uh, computer systems to maintain the blockchain and they get rewarded. Um, proof of stake, uh, Ethereum moved from proof of work to proof of stake this past year. And proof of stake, basically people uh, get together and stake their or rent out, so to, so to speak, their Ethereum to maintain the, the integrity of the system. Um, and there's a voting system and, and so on. Proof of stake is about 99% less uh, energy demanding than proof of work. So uh, for environmental reasons, as well as others, uh, Ethereum moved from proof of work to proof of stake. I don't believe that is the, the, the direction that Bitcoin is going. So it still uses a lot of energy. 51% uh, attack, if you basically uh, can control more than 50% of the miners on a, on a Bitcoin blockchain, then you can actually rewrite the blockchain so that you could fill your own wallets up. So that's what we mean by a 51% attack. If you can control uh, just over half um, of, the, of the computers running a particular blockchain. Herman, we had a question from uh, Kat sure. that says, what do you mean by immutability? Okay, immutability basically means it can't be changed. So um, if you if, if Jordan sends me some Bitcoin, um, and maybe, maybe it's for a scam reason, uh, there's no way that he can get it back, okay? Unless I, do, you know, there is no change. Everybody has recorded that transaction and it cannot be changed. And th that's why I've, I said most of the times it's immutable. When we have a fork, basically it's a decision to break that immut immutability. So Bitcoin um, has broken it in the past, Ethereum has broken it in the past. If you, if you want to maintain the original blockchain, then you need to um, you know, work with Bitcoin Cash or Ethereum Classic. Now, Having said that, you will find that most people will, you know, um, participate in the in the uh, in in the reversal of the immutability for one or two, you know, hacks, and they will stay with Bitcoin or Ethereum. And you will see that you can look at trading volume of Bitcoin Cash, for example, or Ethereum Classic, for example, and you see that there's much less interest in those than there is in the um, the ones that have 
reversed some of the some of the nefarious things that have happened. Okay, good to know. We have more questions, but I'm going to save them until later on. So I'll, I'll pass back to you. Okay, thank you. So, um, blockchains are 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 basically, as I said, distributed ledgers, and uh, there's it's a technology. Um, so if you if you are buying, for example, a Bitcoin or uh, an Ether coin, you are you are not getting anything physical. You are getting basically a recognition in some computer code that you own something. Okay, some digital code. That's it. Okay, so the technology is very useful. I mean, it is it's been around for what 14 years now, and it hasn't gone away. So people that say you know it's rather useless. I would argue that if it was, it would have disappeared by now. There's also, um, I, I guess, a, a battle going on between what's called permissioned and permissionless blockchains. So Bitcoin and Ethereum, for example, are what are called permissionless. In other words, you can you can buy them. You can go to a, a trading platform you can, or an exchange. Typically, the trading platforms refer to themselves as exchanges. You can you can buy them. You don't need anyone's permission to do so. Uh, there are other blockchains that are being built that are that are basically private blockchains, and you require permission to participate in those. So Ripple XRP is the is the uh, acronym for Ripple. They are set up there. There are I believe nine nodes, nine computer systems that basically manage that. So um it's a it's kind of a closed system their goal is to have banking traditional banking systems use their blockchain so if you have a large international bank that wants to transfer funds to another uh, international bank in another country um, they could possibly do that through a private blockchain that a number of banks have agreed upon to use and of course you as an individual would not be allowed or permission have permission to trade on that blockchain Okay. Generally speaking, most blockchains are permissionless. The the question was in you know going forward, uh, what is going to uh, predominate? Is it going to be permissioned or permissionless? Non fungible tokens. That's you know something that's uh, been out fairly recently, maybe about two or three years. Those are tokens that are valued because they are they represent unique collectibles. So for the for for example, if you buy a Bitcoin or a, or a, an Ether coin, you you know whether you buy one or two and and sell them and you buy them from different people, they're all basically the same. So if if I buy 0.5 of an Ether and I buy another 0.5 of an Ether, I will basically have one Ether, and it'll be recognized as such. So they're 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 mutually interchangeable, okay? and they don't I don't lose any value if I split them up. Um, a non-fungible token is just the opposite. It's typically a piece of artwork or or music or uh, could be physical, could be could be uh, non-physical, but uh, you know there's no two alike. And I'll give you a, a couple of examples a little later. Um, they seem to be they, they took off a couple of years ago. Um, I'll, I'll show you a couple of examples. And even though you may have ownership to a non-fungible token, it does not mean that other people will not necessarily be using it. And there are every every couple of months, there are some new terms. Um, a newer term that sort of crept up lately is called a DEX, D-E-X. And that is a distributed exchange. So instead of having a uh, a trading platform that's sort of privately owned and privately the, the code is more or less private. A distributed exchange basically is open source, and it's they're starting to gain some traction because um, people don't want to be subject to you know somebody somebody's whims. Whoever owns that private exchange can um, do things that you may not agree with. Okay, some legal terminology. Um, if you are in Canada and you want to uh, pay your taxes, you will you will have to submit it using what's called legal tender. 
it, basically money that's officially declared money by the government of Canada, or if you're in another jurisdiction, by that government. So in Canada, it would be banknotes issued by the Bank of Canada or coins issued by the Royal Canadian Mint. Okay, but the Bank of Canada is also considering a central bank digital currency. So if the Bank of Canada, which is the monetary authority in Canada, if they um, create a central bank digital currency, what you would be looking at is basically a, a permissioned uh, currency system. So crypto assets would not be included in this. Um, just uh, this past week, here's some of the features um, that they hope it would have. And the reason the Bank of Canada is getting involved is because they they are responsible for controlling monetary policy. Um, they're also the lender of last resort to the Canadian banking system, to the federal government, and um, they want to maintain that you know that authority. And some University of Toronto researchers are trying to design it right now. Um, this came out last week. Um, the the central bank is interested in what people think about a central bank digital currency. So uh, if you like, you have until June the 19th to comment, to take a survey on the Bank of Canada website. Um, and, you know, they're, they're doing the research to see what the level of interest is um, and what's important in a in such a package. In the U.S., they're also looking at it uh, not as not as quickly, I would say, but there is a country called El Salvador which basically has made uh, Bitcoin uh, legal tender along with its own uh, currency. So, why is everybody interested? Well, the answer is to make money, okay? But there's lots of there's lots of risk involved. Okay, first of all, it's impossible to predict ahead of time, uh, forecast what the value of a crypto asset is going to be going forward. Um, my belief is that there is value to the technology, um, but there's, there's also a lot of noise. There's a lot of background noise. Uh, I'll show you a slide later on that shows you um, how many crypto assets basically have disappeared and why they've disappeared. So to date, Bitcoin has captured most people's attention. Uh, but I don't think it's going to have the largest economic impact of the of the technology. There's there's much more that can be done with the technology. Basically, Bitcoin can be bought and sold. It can be you know transferred across international boundaries relatively inexpensively. Um, but that's that's essentially all it does. So if you're concerned about a you know your government's fiat currency just you know going down in value, then um, you know, this might be an alternative. Um, countries where that have very high inflation rates, like Argentina, will also have uh, people, more people investing in uh, a crypto asset like Bitcoin. Okay. So if you want to, if you want to start investing in it, um, or speculating, it might be a better term. Uh, there's a number of alternative approaches you can take. The first of all, you can buy a crypto asset directly. Okay, you can use you can use your fiat currency like the Canadian dollar, for example, or U.S. dollar. Go to a trading platform or or as they refer to themselves as an exchange, and trade your fiat currency for um, for any crypto asset that they have available. Now, recognize that this is a this is internet based, so it's borderless. You can you will find exchanges anywhere around the world. In some areas of the world, there are fewer regulations than in others. Um, typically the US dollar is used most often, but there are also what are called stable coins, uh, which are crypto assets that are pegged to the US dollar or that attempt to be pegged to the US dollar. Um, they're rising in popularity uh, as is Bitcoin as a, you know, the one side of the trade. And the reason for using a stable coin, for example, is that you can uh, do your trades quickly. You don't have to uh, exchange it for for actual U.S. dollars and then back again. Um, not there's not a lot of trading of crypto assets. If you look at the total volume, if you look, for example, at uh, Canadian dollar, U.S. dollar, any other major currencies in the world, uh, what proportion of their value is traded? It's it's 
over 50% per day, but only 3% of crypto assets are traded per day. So it's a relatively speaking, it's a relatively small market. Uh, the other thing to be aware of is that most trading platforms are not regulated. Um, you may have heard of FTX. Uh, it was, I think, run out of the Bahamas or Bermuda, but but in an area where the regulations are relatively unsophisticated. Um, if you are interested in um, sort of a semi-regulatory um, jurisdiction, well, the Canadian Securities Administrators, they have a what is called a regulatory sandbox. So in other words, you can, uh, crypto asset trading platforms can try out. Um, they can get some type of approval. So there's there are decisions there that are available. Most of them are on Canadian platforms, but there are some, um, I think believe there's one or two US platforms on there as well that have that have basically agreed to pay play by the rules of the Canadian Securities Administrators. Okay, but because it's a sandbox, the the uh, restrictions have, have been loosened somewhat compared to uh, say other types of trading platforms. Uh, this is some just a bit of history. Uh, the first uh, exchange or trading platform in Canada was CA Vertex. So CA for Canada, VART for virtual, and then EX for exchange. It was in Ottawa. Um, I had an account with them and then Kraken, which is based in California, bought them. So now I have a Kraken account. So those things happen as well. Your exchanges that, that are private um, can be bought and sold. I also had um, two, two um, Ether coins with Quadriga CX, which uh, collapsed due to fraud. Um, just recently, they, um, they I guess it's about eight, five years ago now, the the uh, bankruptcy trustee has um, you know settled most of the issues, and I will probably get back about thirteen cents for every dollar that I've invested. So this fraud, you know, it's it's a very interesting story. There's even I believe a movie or a documentary on it now. Um, so you know I got burnt. You can get burnt if if there's some uh, nefarious people behind the exchange. Um, some of the other terms you might come across, ICOs or ITOs, so initial coin offerings or initial token offerings. They're basically um, a takeoff on what's called an initial public offering, which is something that happens in a regulated market. So if you want to sell shares uh, to the public in Canada, you will have to do what's called an initial public offering the first time you sell those shares to the public and you'll have to jump through many hoops to um, qualify to do that. Uh, anything else would be illegal. Not so with an ICO or, or ITO because they tend not to be regulated, but to give the impression that they are, they've used the terms IT, ICO and ITO. Airdrops, this is what, you know, my $10 that I showed in my previous slide where they came from. They're basically free coins. So anybody who's starting a new crypto asset, they'll say, to get some traction, they'll say, we're gonna offer some free coins to everyone, but you have to give your email address and some other details. And you can you can find them on ICO marks. For example, Telegram, there's other sources of leads. And then there are other sites that actually uh, rate the airdrops. So of all of those 14 uh, airdrops that I, participated in, I think uh, there's only like four of them that are worth anything. The rest have basically gone to zero or stayed at zero. And the ones that are worth something are not worth very much. So a lot of effort, not very much return for airdrops, but they're kind of fun. Um, this is the this is the one that is worth something. It's the GET protocol. I don't even know what that stands for or what they do anymore, but I had two of them. And it's you can see there's the same wallet again that shows you um, what's in there. So there are some uh, crypto trading platforms that are domiciled in Canada, so they're in Canada. Um, this is not don't consider this an endorsement. Uh, some of them actually appear a bit sketchy to me. Uh, one of the downsides of these uh, is that they have a limited number of crypto assets that you can trade in. Um, I have 
accounts with, I believe, CoinSmart or CoinSquare. I don't know, can't remember one of these two, uh, CoinBerry and also Wealthsimple. So, um, and they have very small amounts with each. It's just, I'm just trying them out. Okay. Now, there are many other jurisdictions that will, that have trading platforms that will very happily accept your Canadian dollars. But uh, as I said, uh, be careful. Now, the other thing you might want to know is is what they charge for doing a transaction. So in, in addition to what's called the spread, the difference between the bid price and the ask price for a crypto asset, they may also charge a, a commission or some type of transaction fee. So you can compare them to see how much you'd have to pay for that as well. Typically, it's about 0.2%. Some other large spot exchanges, Binance is the largest one. This is the one um, originated by a, a Chinese Canadian. It's uh, it's uh, I think it's operating out of Sh Shanghai, but I believe it may have moved to Singapore. I'm not sure. Uh, Coinbase Pro also in the U.S. fairly big. Uh, Kraken is also fairly big. Um, and if you open an account, there are what are called know your client rules. They vary from country to country, jurisdiction to jurisdiction. Also, anti-money laundering, um, proceeds from crime type of rules, they vary as well from country to, to country. And the types of cryptocurrencies that you can trade or what type of fiat currencies are accepted, that also differs on different exchanges in different jurisdictions. Typically, the US dollar is accepted just about everywhere. So one of the one of the issues is that once you buy your crypto asset, is where you're going to keep it. It's something of value, and valuable valuables have to be stored. So you can leave it on the exchange. So in other words, on an online wallet where it's convenient if you wanted to, to trade it, but it's also subject to being hacked. You could download it to your computer or your your, your phone, your uh, smartphone, and you'd need a software wallet for that. And that's called a hot wallet. Um, and a hot wallet basically, it's hot because in other words, if your computer gets hacked, it can still be stolen, okay? And then finally, you can download it to a USB type of device like a, a Trezor or a, a Ledger Nano X, which are basically um, a little USB stick that you attach to your uh, laptop, um, but it's still subject to hack to hacking unless you actually disconnect it from the internet. So in other words, you have to take your, your USB stick out and put it somewhere safe, okay? The last thing you can do is you can have a paper wallet where basically you print off your holdings and it's, it's in paper, so don't lose the paper. Don't let it get damaged or burnt or anything. Um, but that's another, there's another option. So I have, right now, I just have a, a hot wallet and an online wallet. I don't have a, a hardware wallet because my my investments tend to be relatively modest. So this is my hot wallet. This is a picture from yesterday. I have uh, just over one ether in there. It's worth I think two thousand four hundred Canadian yesterday. I have um, some live peer, very little, and I also have Tron. This migrated to uh, its own. Um, blockchain. So uh, I have to figure out a way to to migrate this one. Otherwise, it's basically useless. Um, so if you 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 can also uh, get in early on an initial coin or token offering. Um, typically, it's cheaper, but you have a bunch of questions to ask. And if you are going to buy it, um, you know, you really want to know some key questions. Like basically, what does decentralization decentralization bring to the table. If it's a, a token that does a certain, performs a certain utility, that that utility is also performed in some type of centralized system, what does centralization, decentralization actually, um, or what advantage does it have or give? Um, who are the people behind it? Do they have a history of success or not? Typically, the team that is creating a, a new crypto asset is keeping a portion for itself. Is it a large portion? Is it a small portion? Um, there are inflation rates associated with tokens. So Bitcoin 
is deflationary. There will only ever be 21 uh, million Bitcoins. But other tokens, there are you know, regularly new issues of those tokens. So there's an inflation component to them. So that more tokens, similar amount of value, uh, their token value should depreciate as a, as a result. But given all of those negatives, there might be momentum. So everybody, everybody might be crazy about a certain crypto asset like Dogecoin, which uh, serves no purpose at all. It was created as a joke. Um, but if you can send it, sell it later on to a so-called greater fool, uh, you know, good for you. So currently there's well over 1,000 crypto assets in existence. Most of them are worthless. Um, you know, a utility token, as I mentioned before, allows you to uh, purchase a good or service. A security token represents ownership in a physical or digital asset. These are the ones that our regulators are most concerned about because here you're basically buying a good or service, which are, you know, the, the trading regulatory agencies are not too concerned about that. Here's a picture that came, this is, you can look at this up, it's coinkickoff.com. These are the number of uh, basically dead coins or, and then the year in which they disappeared. And you can see that most of them were either, um, either abandoned or have no volume anymore. Um, there are, there's a blue area here for also fairly large, those are scams, which basically, you know, try to steal people's funds. And there's some other ones, the little thin yellow line are, are jokes. They serve no purpose at all. And um, then there are some that are, that are, that, that just basically failed. So um, another way of investing in crypto assets is through the stock market. You can buy, for example, exchange traded funds. You don't need a wallet. The exchange traded fund keeps your assets in cold storage uh, through a trust system. Um, they're regulated by the regulatory authorities. So in the Toronto Stock Exchange, you can buy them. It's a regulated stock exchange. You can buy and sell them. Uh, I guess you can start now, anytime after 9.30 in the morning. Um, and you can buy them for your tax deferred or tax free accounts. Okay. And actually, interestingly, uh, Canada was first in offering Bitcoin exchange traded funds. You can see that they came out rather rapidly in succession two years ago. Um, I actually have some of the second group here, I believe, the evolved ones. Okay. Um, some of them are more liquid, so they trade more often than others. And basically, they go up and down with the price of Bitcoin. Okay, in the US, however, you still cannot buy um, exchange traded funds that are crypto based. However, you'll find that all of these also offer US dollar uh, crypto ETFs so that you can, if you're an American or subject to an American jurisdiction, you can still buy them in Canada. And here are those similar ones for uh, uh, Ether or Ethereum that came out uh, shortly after. These are the four, four big ones. You can also buy traditional stocks in, uh, that, that are related to uh, distributed ledger technology. So companies that mine Bitcoin, um, companies that um, run an exchange like Netcoins is, is uh, there's a sticker symbol BIGG, which is traded on the Canadian Securities Exchange. Um, you can buy into the actual company buy and sell the shares. There's an energy trading company that traded on the venture exchange. I don't know if they're still in existence or not. And the same with this other one, Victoria Square Technologies. So the there, there are a hierarchy of exchanges as well. So the CSE is kind of at the bottom end. The venture is somewhere in the middle. And then there's the, the Toronto Stock Exchange, um, the, large, the large board on which you can trade these other ones. You can also buy them in this in the U.S. So Riot is a company that uh, has other investments in other companies like uh, CoinSquare and so on, plus bit mining companies. Um, Greenscale has a trust. Okay, so you can buy a trust unit. Um, 
MicroStrategy trades on the New York Stock Exchange. This is the major stock exchange in the US. And um, they they do other things other than hold Bitcoin, but typically, quite often, the value of the Bitcoin that the company owns uh, exceeds the value of the stock. So you could buy sort of Bitcoin at a discount in a sense. Uh, futures, is there a type of security as well? Uh, similar, basically it's a it's an option type of contract where you you buy or sell on a future price. And the commodity futures exchange, the, the regulators for commodity futures in the US are more lenient than the Securities and Exchange Commission. So this is where most of the trading happens in the US. What does, fungibility is an important term. So in other words, if you have a dollar or if you have um, say $20 and you exchange it for $10, you haven't lost any value. Same with Bitcoin and Ethereum. These are all fungible. Non-fungible, meaning that they are unique uh, and there's only one one of a kind. So crypto kitties, I'll talk to a bit about that in a minute. You can have artwork that's non-fungible. There's only one Mona Lisa, for example. If you own real estate, a house or property, there's only one house exactly on a specific location. Um, so these are called, these are non-fungible. Okay, so here are platforms where you can, um, well, some of them are actual, CryptoKitties is a, well, actually, and all, all of these you can buy and sell crypto, non-fungible tokens or NFTs. I want to say a few more things about that. Um, Elon Musk of Tesla fame and SpaceX um, sold an NFT about a, an NFT. So you can have NFTs about just about anything. This is a picture called Disaster Girl. It, the story is quite interesting. It just happened that a father was uh, walking over to a fire that was happening in the neighborhood and he was walking with his daughter. She turned to look at him and it looks like she's an arsonist because of the way her eyes sort of are posed. Um, and it, it sold for 750,000 Canadian. But as you can see, I have the picture here. So even though someone owns the non-fungible token, that doesn't mean that other people are not able to use it as well. But it's a it's a it's a very interesting picture. Um, yeah, some more some more uh, decentralized type of uh, NFTs. I don't own any of these. So this is a, you know, this chart is a little bit dated, but you can see here where initial coin offering was a term that was um, had a big trend on Google Trends. Everybody was interested in it. Uh, it kind of peaked in 2017, and then non-fungible tokens started climbing uh, in 2021. So th there are ebbs and flows in in people's interests. The other way you can invest is you can create your own cryptocurrency. Um, and you can get, you can pay, possibly raise millions or if not billions of US dollars, and you can build it on a, an existing open source blockchain. So CryptoKitties, which I sh um, showed you in a, just a previous slide, um, it launched in November, I forget which year. And in the first month, uh, you know, you could so-called breed kittens and they would take three and three quarter percent of the of the cost, and they made um, over twelve million dollars just in the first month alone. Okay, and even if the cryptocurrency calls itself useless, money seems to flow in. So there are, you know, Deutschcoin. It was created as a joke, but it has some value. People give it some value. And there's even a website that lets you tells you how you can create a cryptocurrency in less than 10 minutes. There's existing snippets of code that you can just replicate. And there's lots of stories. The one that's quite interesting is, is May 22nd, which is coming up shortly. It will be in, uh, I guess, the 13th anniversary of Bitcoin Pizza Day. So what happened? Well, in Florida, uh, someone ordered uh, a pizza 
two pizzas actually, for 10,000 Bitcoins, which were, which was, I don't know, worth about 20 some dollars at that time in US dollar terms. Today, that those 10,000 Bitcoins are worth between 70 and $75 million Canadian. So it's kind of a, a joke to refer to this as Bitcoin Pizza Day. There's lots of other things that happen. Um, yeah, you used to be able to buy a Tesla for Bitcoin, but that's no longer possible. But of course, if you have some Bitcoin, you can exchange it for fiat currency and 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 still buy a Tesla if you need one. Uh, that's it for me, Jordan. I'm happy awesome. to answer any questions. For sure, yeah. With that, I'll, I'll share my screen again, just to dive into the questions here. Um, we have four marked in the Q&A. The, the first one, it says, <clears throat> I'm a bit skeptical about cryptocurrency because my sister-in-law who resides in London lost all of her investments to crypto as the funds just vanished. How credible, reliable, and safe are these cryptocurrencies? So I know you discussed this a bit, but uh, mm -hmm. could you elaborate further on sort of this question? Yeah. Um, yeah, there are a lot of scams. I, I had a student once, um, a Nigerian student, who uh, was sort of investing in a particular crypto asset, and can't remember what it was called, but it kept going up in value and it was guaranteed to go up in value. And you could always, you know, supposedly uh, exchange it for, for a fiat currency uh, at any time down the road. Um, I, was, I was skeptical because there's no such thing as a guarantee in finance of any sort. Um, governments can provide some type of guarantee, but even governments fail sometimes. So, um, yeah, there is a lot of risk involved. Um, I, I would never, I, I dabbled in it. I would never invest more than say 5% of my assets in, in, in crypto assets at this point in time. I, where, where the value is, is in the technology. And I think there are, there are probably some um, crypto assets now that are um, developing some useful technologies. And the, the question is, you know, what what does decentralized technology or distributed technology actually bring to the table? And if it brings something useful to the table, there may be some value there, but you have to be very careful. As I said, Bitcoin, it exists, you can trade it. Um, there's a limit to it. So maybe it has some deflationary value, some uh, similar to gold. But it is, there's no, it's just a piece of computer code that you're buying in all cases. Okay. So another question we have is how do cryptocurrencies enable or prevent financial crimes such as money laundering? Uh, there's, uh, I read this morning that the uh, Secret Service in the US did a an AMA and Ask Me Anything um, about how they attack cybercrime. And they seem to be successful. There are certain uh, crypto assets that are specifically designed to to be more anonymous, to facilitate crime. Um, so I personally don't invest in them. I don't. I don't. I think it's unfortunate. But um, it, the the amount of crime that takes place using crypto assets versus uh, say U.S. dollars, physical U.S. dollars, is minuscule. Most most crimes, uh, financial crimes, still take place in uh, fiat currencies. So it could be um, bearer bonds, for example. That you know, if if you hold them, they're yours, or cash. Um, most crimes still occur. Most financial crimes still occur that in that way. Okay. Another question. Um... This is from Katya, it says, this may be a silly or stupid question, but are there actual people behind Bitcoin in terms of people who run the company? Yeah, that's just, that's the whole uh, premise of distributed ledger technology is that no one single individual um, manages the, the crypto asset. So Bitcoin, um, there is no company behind it. Um, it's just computer code and it's, it's self, self, it runs on itself, on its own. Um, Ethereum does have um, a council, um, but 
what the council does is it looks at proposals for changing the code. Um, the council then uh, selects some of those proposals for for future upgrades, let's call it, and then um, the community basically votes on it with their with their crypto assets, with their stakes. Um, so per se, there is not um, there aren't any companies. That said, there are there are other assets like uh, Ripple, which are controlled by nine computer uh, nodes. So the people behind those are actually in charge of of the asset. So you have you have to basically do your homework and find out um, just how distributed the technology is, or how permissionless it is. Um, there are specific tokens um, that work on on governance. So uh, a DAO is a distributed autonomous organization. So in other words, the governance is set up so that no one has to run it. Uh, they're still in the infant stages. Uh, there are so many things that can go wrong with a regular company that to try and capture that all in computer code is is very challenging. Hasn't happened yet. Yes. Um, okay, so two more questions and then we'll have to wrap it up here, folks. Uh, this one is, what are the effects of cryptocurrencies on the money supply of the economy? Very minor. Um, the The money supply in the economy is, in any economy, is huge. And uh, even though, you know, Bitcoin might be worth a trillion dollars or so, um, if you look at the total money supply in, in any economy, well, most economies around the world, you'll find that, that it dwarfs, um, you know, crypto assets. Uh, that said, that could change going forward. We don't really know. And the final question to, to wrap things up today is, what is the value of crypto based on? Ah, it's the same. It's the same way that anything else is valued. Uh, real estate, stocks that are trading on the internet. It's a. It's a, Whatever people are willing to pay for it and willing to sell it for, and where there's an agreement. So, if if you if I, for example, buy a, a stock of a particular company and I'm willing to pay a certain amount for that. And I, you know, put that out there on the, on the, you know, through a broker on the stock exchange and someone else is willing to sell it for me. Um, then there's a, an exchange takes place. And the, there's a question of, you know, for every exchange, it's a basic, essentially a zero sum game. One of, one of us is right. One of us is wrong. Um, if I buy it uh, and I pay too much, then I've made a mistake. If I buy it and the person selling it, uh, you know, has sold it cheap, then they've made a mistake. So it's a, it's a zero sum game. And it's the same thing with any crypto asset. It's what a person is, you know, what, what's the market price? What do millions of people who are trading these currencies believe that they're worth? What they're wanting to sell it for? What they're wanting, it's a, where the supply and, de, and demand crossover, essentially. You'll learn that in economics. And that ties into some of the terminology we went over. If I'm making the proper connection here, a whale who owns a significant mm -hmm. amount uh, would be able to sway that valuation too. I mean, we saw some famous examples of when Elon Musk started tweeting about Dogecoin and exactly. you know, there were surges in their pricing and, and valuation. Exactly. Awesome. Well, thank you to our audience for posing those questions. It, it was really great to hear from you and, and also learn more about your perspective. Um, with that being said, I want to take this opportunity to thank you, Dr. Herman Vandenberg, for joining us. It's been a pleasure hosting you. Before I let everyone go, though, I want to remind you to follow us and stay connected. You can find us at Lakin International on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. If you would like to explore one of our campuses, you can do so from the comfort of your own home. If you head over to lakinu.ca forward slash tours, all of our virtual campus tours are accessible there. At the beginning of our session today, I did chat a bit about some of our other upcoming events later on this week and, and beyond into the next few weeks. So you can always scan the QR code or visit lakeheadu.ca forward slash international dash live to uh, visit those and secure that seat today. On that note, though, uh, it's been my pleasure to host today's session. And once again, thank you to Dr. Herman Vandenberg for joining us and sharing more about crypto assets. Uh, thank you for joining us and hopefully we will see you at the next event, everyone.
Bye for now. I hope you enjoyed the video. If you have any questions, I want to encourage you to comment below or connect with us on social media. We can be found at Lake and International on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. Thanks for watching once again, and hopefully we'll see you at the next live webinar. Bye for now.